A very good morning and welcome to Lati, the final day of the 89th edition of the annual Winter Games here. Mike Dixon alongside myself, David Goldstrom, and a rather empty stadium, I have to say, although the clock is moving towards 10.45 locally, a little disappointing not to see more fans out here for the men's 15-kilometer freestyle individual test today. And it's a big field, 95 competitors from 20 countries, so that really is healthy and this is always a, a favorite place for the cross-country skiers to come to because they always know they're going to get a really decent test. Well, we have a busy day here for you. We have, uh, as you can see at the moment, live on Eurosport International, the women's downhill from Cron Montana. Wonderful course, that. Here, we're just about to get underway on the men's 15-kilometer freestyle. The Alpine skiing continues from Norway on Eurosport International, the Supergiant slalom there. And then we're back with the women's 10K, Charlotte Caller in action. That should be really interesting. And to round off the uh, weekend here in Lati, it's the ski jumping whilst uh, on Eurosport 2, the women, their second event of the weekend over in Raznov in Romania, new venue for the Women's World Cup. And then uh, if you missed uh, the race we're about to do now, then you'll get a chance to see it again on Eurosport International. Mike, here's the course that lies ahead. David, and it's a testing course. Look at the undulations as we go along here, 1,500 uh, metres, now at two and a half, three kilometres, just continually up and down. And there was a lot of talk in Sochi on the 15 kilometre track there. Well, the Sochi one only climbed for 544 metres. This one, David, there's a total climb of 630 metres over the 15 kilometres. And, and we have a lot of switchbacks, a lot of difficult technical turns. So the athletes uh, over the years coming to Lati have always said this is one of the hardest on the whole World Cup tour. Well, it's going to be about uh, eight minutes past the hour before we get to the red group who get underway with Germany's uh, Tim Schanke. Just worth mentioning uh, that in action here today, we've got Alex Harvey and Alexander Legkoff, the hero of the 50 kilometers race. So uh, that'll be uh, a really good moment because Legkoff is vying for the Crystal Globe for the distance. So just a minute or so before we get underway in this World Cup a men's 15 kilometer individual freestyle uh, skate race here. Mike Dixon alongside myself, David Goldstrom and 95 competitors to get underway representing 20 nations and uh, still uh, a very important part of the season for those up at the top of the front of the World Cup rankings in the men's division. Martin uh, Sundby of Norway with 1,027 points in the overall title. Uh, well ahead of Chris Jepsperson of Norway, his teammate, 739. But then Legkov, 626. Uh, Petter Nortug not involved today. And clearly things are not good with his health. He simply isn't firing on all cylinders. Those of you who were with us yesterday will know that he actually didn't make the cut, didn't make the 30 for the sprint competition. Anyway, sit back and enjoy this with us. It's a 15 kilometer race, three times round a challenging five kilometer track. And here's the man who's going to get us underway with uh, perhaps a very appropriate name, Carl Quicklund. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see just how fast he is because he is first man away. So the initial pathfinder, this 22 year old who in terms of World Cup racing is still very much a rookie, only half a dozen starts. So an interesting test for him. It was interesting to see Carl Quicklund there on the start line. He was almost hyperventilating. So he's been out for his warm up. He's gone through all his normal uh, preparations and uh, psyching up on the line. And uh, of course, lots to do before. You've got to check your skis, get the transponders on your both legs before you come to the start line. Another of the Swedes, Gustav Eriksson and the Swedes with a couple of 22 year olds going off early here, not wearing the national white suit, this young man, but it does shows you, just shows you the depth and the progress the Swedish cross country team have made just a year or so away from the Nordic Ski World Championships in Falun. It's very timely indeed. 
Fulvio Scola. More a sprinter, eh, I would say. David, uh, looking at all his track records, of course, he has gone the distance. Fifth, 41st position in Oslo at the World Championships. That was in the classic style. Today is the free technique, freestyle. So no grip wax on the base of the skis. It's all the fastest possible glide wax in these warm conditions once again. And just to make the point about uh, today's competition being pretty important, here we are in Lati. The tour goes to Holman Collen next weekend for the famous mass start race there. The classic, it isn't quite the race it was uh, once upon a time when it was the individual classic, but nonetheless a, a really good race and a lot of bonus points to be uh, up there as well. And then to Falun for the final skiathlon of the season. So basically, including today, 300 points up for grabs. Now, why that's important is because if you look at the men's distance ranking points, and there's a crystal globe for the best long distance or endurance racer, Chris Jesperson of Norway is ahead of Sunby, the two Norwegians, but Jesperson only leads Sunby by 13 points, and Legkoff, the hero of uh, Sochi, he's only 36 points back, and he's involved today. And Alex Harvey's 112 points back, and he's involved today. So that distance, Crystal Globe, is very much up for grabs. It is, and, and that's where I think you know, Colonia, as you see, and uh, Nortud not here. Well, they really are missing a, a chance uh, to, to bolster. Of course, Colonia missed so much, he's not in the running for the main titles. But uh, I would have thought that Peter Nortug would have uh, tried his absolute hardest to be on the start line today, so clearly unwell. I, I think when something gets inside you like that vi virus or perhaps some bacteria uh, and you know basically rest is the best cure quite often for an awful lot of ailments that cross-country skiers have to endure throughout their career and probably uh, it was the best thing to duck today whether he goes in the 50 next week in Oslo, that'll be uh, interesting to see. But it hasn't been Peda Nortug's uh, season, that's for sure. And indeed, with her Colonia, well, a couple of gold medals at the uh, Winter Olympics, what more do we want of him? And, you know, he may also have decided that having managed to get back to a condition where he was able to be that successful, that because of the disruptions of the season, Mike, that it was then prudent to just rest. I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think it was so unfortunate at the Olympics. He won those two gold medals in the 50 kilometer. He was in the chase with 1.2 kilometers to go. And similar to four years previously, when he fell in the last 100 meters, he fell with 1.2 kilometers to go. And uh, my opinion at that time was that he had a real, real chance for another gold medal had he not fallen. So a real pity for Colonia. So, once again, a shot of the anti-doping board for those of you who are not familiar with that, with the athletes signing on to commit themselves to making sure that their sport is as clean as possible. Mike and myself both know that it'll never be possible for it to be totally clean because there'll always be someone out there who looks to gain an advantage. Uh, the likes of Austria's Johannes Duer, one of uh, five athletes uh, found out in the Sochi Winter Olympics. And um, I'm really sad about that because Austria's recent history has not been good. And to find another athlete, and indeed a promising athlete, like Johannes Dorr, who was, what, eighth in the skiathlon in the opening race. Um, that is hugely disappointing. And, and David, throughout the season, we've been looking at Johannes Dorr and uh, amazed at his performances. The Tour de Ski had the fastest time up the final climb. And boy, did he look amazingly fast. Uh, he showed it all season. And uh, at the Olympic Games to be done, uh, I don't think they should be allowed to come back from that because, uh, and the Austrians' history, you mentioned it, it hasn't been good. Remember, the relay team was disqualified in 2006 at the Olympic Games and then in Sapporo another two athletes uh, found out they keep on doing it well to more important things uh, at this moment in time here this is uh, Kevin Sandor for Canada just on his way and 
in the purple for the Japanese team. They've chosen that very distinctive colour, which I think is a very wise thing, so you, their fans can follow them. This is Akira Lenting, also uh, in his early 20s. And this is a man at junior world level a few years ago that was finishing top 10 in the 20 pursuits and the 10 kilometer classic. Those were good and promising results. So it might be a man to keep an eye on for four years hence. Well, just reflecting on the course here, Mike, uh, you know this course very well. I mean, you've raced around here many a time, and in a way, this is one of the toughest tests, and the way it brings you round the ski jumping hills and then back on that terrace is very traditional. It's a wonderful course, and uh, it's a course which has been used. I raced here uh, way back in 1989 at the World Championships here, just brought in for uh, the relay and uh, the 15 kilometer, I think it was. But yeah, it's a, it's a traditional, you, you, especially with the lovely three ski jumps in the background. And normally there's a lot of uh, spectators out on the track, not that many today. And there's a wonderful his history and atmosphere in this uh, stadium as well. Some great races, some great names winning. Yeah, yours was the era of the very talented and uh, very attractive Mario Matikainen, uh, who went on to become a MP in the Finnish Parliament, and uh, that was the first Nordic World Ski Championships I actually commentated on. And for me, she was one of the big stars. She really arrived in 1989. Yeah, she absolutely was. And of course, the biathlon. We used to come here for the biathlon. I raced five times here into the stadium in the biathlon world cups as well always uh, fantastic coming to lati so bib number 17 today worn by britain's uh, andy musgrave and we wish him well and hope that he has you know a better bit of fortune because the olympics did not go his way we've got our own ideas about that but it would be really nice to see him get a positive result before the season ends. It would, and he is a super, super athlete, super guy, and super talented. Uh, I'm sure we will see him uh, on the podium in the future in this sport. What a talent he is. But yeah, 29th at the Olympics in the sprint, which I think was very disappointed, uh, knowing Andy well, uh, disappointing for him. Yeah, it didn't make the cut yesterday, and clearly, I mean, our thoughts, and they are only our thoughts, are that actually the last phase of preparation uh, didn't go well and that's where uh, perhaps he lost his opportunities and they need to revisit that as i'm sure they have already and will continue to do so to see what they can learn uh, because he's only young he's only 23 years of age he won the norwegian sprint title before going to the olympic games so clearly he has plenty to offer and although you know 29th might sound uh, ooh, down the field you've got to recognize that he's actually the best we've ever had at cross-country skiing oh without a doubt without a doubt we must uh, mention as well andrew young andrew did really well 37th in the 15 kilometer that beats uh, John Spotswood's record from uh, way back 1988, where John uh, took 38th position. Different. Morning, everybody, up at the Huntley Nordic Ski Club. Hope you're with us, uh, at least uh, before you get out and get active yourselves. To We'll track uh, Andy Musgrave's progress for you as we go through this race. But it's just early days now as it begins to unfold. Uh, the fastest up the first climb of 1.3 kilometers at the moment is Bernard Tritcher of Austria wearing bib number 11 in 321.8. And Gustav Eriksson, who was number two to start, he is now through the 3.4 kilometers in 8 minutes 54. You can see the track, David, how, yes, it's one degrees. It's all artificial snow, uh, very little natural snow falling in this area. And uh, it will, I think, become even more sugary, more broken up. So I think these earlier starters have a, a very slight advantage for the first five kilometers. Same track three times. So moving up here now, this is the second check and then they've got 1600 meters to bring them back into the stadium Hawke for uh, Austria 
and Max, only 21 years of age, went to the Olympic Games in Sochi, did the 15 kilometers classic race and uh, finish outside the top 50 but i think uh, time is on his side and there you can see parise parise uh, just behind trickshaw at the 1.3 kilometers and there he is the uh, fastest at the moment up the initial climb clement paris of uh, france 20 years of age a uh, member of the Majev club and again when you look at his junior performances top 10 in the skiathlon two seasons ago at liberate so a bit of promise there as well for the french and paris as you you mentioned it 20 year old it's a fantastic uh, young athlete and coached by vincent vito so uh, they've got a top class coach he was uh, up there and winning world cups so passing his knowledge down the line and his methods of training seem to be working so well and there, Razim wearing eight, who's uh, eclipsed uh, Rastelli of Italy, who started 30 seconds ahead of him. And Razim, this is up the first 3,400 meters. And this is a busy course. Uh, I know we say this a lot, Mike, but you know, if you're not climbing, you're descending here. It's incredible. Comparative, if uh, I remember the Olympic track, this one here, you're, you're climbing for about 1 minute 40 instead of that 1 minute 5 at the Olympics, the huge hill there. But it does flatten out a little on this section before the final reach. What was your thinking, you know, Mike, in Sochi of the big hill there? Was it uh, was it too dominant a feature? It was a, it was a decisive feature. We saw the races won and lost on that final climb. But I think the the positive aspect is you had a minute, almost a, a minute recovery on the descent prior to it. So it allowed all athletes to to flush a little bit the lactic acid to get the breathing under control before that final attack up the that incredible climb. Andrew Musgrave, uh, quickest, up the first 1,300 metres in 3.15. That's uh, a good seven seconds, nearly, uh, ahead of Bernard Tritcher and Paris. So that's a very positive start. But what we're looking for, Andrew, is to use his energy over the whole of the 15 kilometres. It's fine going up and getting a good tempo going right from the beginning, but uh, you've got to last the course. And once upon a time, that used to be a bit of a problem. He's much better at it now. He certainly is, and that youthful enthusiasm, he is a talent, an amazing talent. Sometimes that youthful enthusiasm runs away from you as an athlete. But I think Andrew has mastered uh, pacing now. And uh, often the way an athlete sets out from the start gate is the intent that they will carry over the whole journey of 15 kilometers. Air temperature this morning absolutely on zero and the snow temperature minus one. And there's a threat of a bit of snow or rain in the air, but hopefully it's not going to come to us. And bib number 30. Pierre to uh, get underway and we're about seven or eight minutes away from the first man in the red group to uh, get underway. We've got Devin Kershaw, Babikov, Matty Hakenen and Volshensev in here, Daniel Rickardson and Jean-Marc Gaia, Robin Duviar and Paul Goldberg. Uh, maybe a bit fortunate to have won the sprint yesterday, but he could be a contender for a double victory over the weekend. He wears bib number 64. Kalle Halvarsson, who was so brilliant last year for the Swedes in the Nordic Ski World Championships, but not the preeminent skier uh, in this season's campaign. Schurota and also Alex Harvey and Legkov and Sunbi. So looking for Andy Musgrave, who won't be that far away from coming up to this 3.4 kilometer checkpoint. Uh, and Knotts there, Knotts was what, some eight seconds down on Andy at that very first climb, but you can't read too much into that. And Knotts uh, is another one of those uh, young and talented Germans coming through. 
Yeah, the Germans men's division certainly needs uh, new talent. Uh, the writing's been on the wall for such a long time that how much longer could they rely on the, you know, the old boys, the, the Summerfields and all the other guys that had won the World Cup? Well, that's right, and Toby Angra there in Sochi and uh, performing well, and performing well prior to it with a top six position in the 15 kilometer. And here comes Andy, high tempo, and he's got the man in front of him who started 13 seconds ahead of him in his sights here. So he was 8.3 seconds quicker than Knotts up the first climb. Knotts, as, uh, as you can see, has also accelerated, and so that's five seconds that Knotts has made on Musgrave since 1.3 kilometers. I love his little gear changes. We just saw him leading on the right side, David, and just getting a little breather on that flat section before the final 200 meter steep climb and then changing to his left side. So lovely uh, technique and resting the lead leg. Rickardson signing on there. Martin Yax, another very experienced campaigner for the uh, Czech Republic. His best, uh, well, 19th in the pursuit uh, freestyle, nine kilometer in Val de Fiem in the Tour de Ski, Yaks, but not his best season, man from Liberec. Larry Leighton, the Finnish guys, of course. I think one of the moments of greatest pleasure for me, Mike, was to see Ivo, uh, Nis uh, Ivo Niskanen and Sami Joey Irvi win the classic gold medal in the Team Classic Sprint, uh, particularly for Joey Irvi. I've mentioned it a few times, but, you know, we've seen him over the years, and, uh, you know, he's, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, a journeyman racer, you know, he was always there or thereabouts, but he wasn't actually getting the medals, and to go to the Olympic Games and, you know, then get a gold medal. I mean, that's a fantastic reward for the work that he's put in over, a, you know, a fantastic career. Because he was the one, after the great doping scandal of 2001 in Lati with the men's team, he was the one man to emerge in a competitive mode. Yes, he was indeed. And, and Niskanen alongside him that day in the team event, uh, what a star, what a talent he is. And he did a busy time, remember, he's winning the Junior World Champs, then going over to Toblach, making his selection and coming uh, well in the top 10 and, uh, and, and performing key part for the Finnish team now at just 21-year-old Niskanen. Nusi Einan there, uh, just uh, behind Andy Musgrave. Now, Nusi Einan is uh, no bad skier. He is seven years uh, more experienced than Andy uh, Musgrave, coached by uh, Magna Dalen. And I have to say, that's uh, an interesting barometer there to have those two men as close as they are. So this could be quite interesting to see whether Nusi Einan and Musgrave can, can actually continue to uh, make good progress. Progress. Florian Knotts uh, has just gone through the halfway, the, sorry, the halfway, the five kilometer, his first rotation, and uh, he's leading by 3.3. In fact, Musgrave just gone through yeah. to take it by 3.3. I was just about to say that, Mike. Uh, 11 minutes, 19.3. So actually, Musgrave and Knotts traveling at about the same race pace at the moment. That's pretty good. Noah Hoffman, David, now we haven't had a 15 kilometer freestyle in this form, but we did in uh, Kusamo have a pursuit 15 kilometer free and Noah Hoffman who's just started he had the fastest time on that day in Finland and that was it the first of December I believe Keshin Yoshida for Japan I just got an instinct you know that by the time we come to the next Winter Olympic Games that the Japanese are gonna have a competitive cross-country quartet they keep threatening, don't they? We always see there's one or two individuals who can perform in that top 15, even top 10. They just need to, to build a deeper base. So, good start by Andy Musgrave, but remember, we're coming up to the start of the red group, and it's Tim Shanker wearing bib number 46, who will lead that particular charge. 
so not doing a, a pretty good job here for Germany. Here he is. Good rhythm. And there you can see 13 seconds ahead of uh, Razim. Now, he was about seven seconds before, so not his traveling really encouraging. And here's Andrew Musgrave. And now you can see that's a really nice shot from our colleagues from Ule, the television host broadcasters here, because it just gave you a little indication of the steepness of the climb. And it is a, a, a very steep one indeed. It just seems to go on forever. A little flat section here. Now, Andy's got knots ahead of him, who is now beginning to lose a little bit of time on this uh, second time out of the stadium. So he's just almost losing five seconds there. Well, actually, I've got that as a bigger turnaround because Musgrave was ahead at the stadium when he came through at five kilometers. So I make that uh, actually an eight seconds it turnaround. Is, it is indeed. Uh, but of course, Andy doing the 50 kilometer at the Olympics one week today, and that is a huge impact on the body with the traveling and the jet lag as well. Not hasn't. So Oscar Svensson getting away for uh, Sweden. Tim Schanke has already started the first of the CD men's. Thomas Bing for uh, Germany. You're seeing some new blood being uh, brought in here by the German squad, and we've touched on that already. And that's really important for them. Lakoff <laughs> looking his usual focus, determined self. Now here's the 23-year-old Thomas Bing coached by uh, Frank Ulrich, and this is a man who, again, who hasn't had even a dozen starts in the World Cup. He went to Sochi, finished a week ago in the 50-kilometer race in 36th place, and was outside the top 30 in both the sprints and the skiathlon, but uh, no harm in him actually experimenting with the distances at his age. Well, and I do think that Thomas Bing, he is a super talent. Uh, Ulrich has, has clearly stated that. And I remember his fourth position in Lenzerheide in the 15-kilometer classic. Now, Nusi Einan here uh, trying to challenge. Now, Nusi Einan was about three, four seconds down on knots. Uh, that was at five kilometers. And he's still going to come up here, go around this right-hander, and you can see that advantage evaporating. So it does actually tell you that Knotts at the moment are uh, a really good start. And for us, he is the pathfinder to note, wearing bib number 16. It's, uh, it will be interesting today. A lot of the athletes, the big names who have just come from the Olympics, they won't be on the, the absolute best form. Clearly, that was for the Olympics. And then the change of time, as I mentioned, or the change in all aspects. They've been to the big goal. They won't quite have the same spirit here. So Nusi Einan in that 1,300 metres coming out of the stadium lost another four seconds. So very similar to uh, Andrew Musgrave. 51 uh, getting away. And uh, here you have uh, Tarasov. Devin Kershaw has just started his challenge for the Canadian team. And they've got Babikov and they've got Alex Harvey here. The Finns have got Haikonen. That could be interesting because I think this is very much his sort of distance. Babikov, well, former Russian racer, took a long time to negotiate the transfer and a bit of money as well, <laughs> but has been settled for many a year now in Canmore. Lovely place. And he sets out there. He's now 33, Babikov. Lettinen coming up to uh, 3.4 kilometers. And the fastest man up to that point was uh, Simon Spin of Norway, ahead of uh, Musgrave, as you can see there in second place at this particular point when he went through. And uh, Lettonen behind uh, Musgrave, ahead of Nusi Aydan. This course profile, David, it allows uh, for so little long recovery. You, you do these long climbs, and it's only like the maximum recovery you've got is about 20 seconds in the glide. Well, here's hiking in now. Little intake of breath. Representing the host nation here. Might have a very good chance. And away he goes. Uh, just want to pick up on uh, Simon Andreas Svin for Norway. Uh, this in only his third World Cup start, and he's got one piece of form to his credit this season, and that was a fifth place finish in the 30 kilometer freestyle in Davos and at the moment up to five kilometers he is the quickest guy 
Tony Livers pushing hard, the man who lives in Davos. Well, he's well used to altitude. There's none of that altitude here. It's only 100 meters, the, the Laddie Stadium, above sea level. But of course, the, it takes the body a little adjustment time down from last week's uh, 1400, 1500 meters where they lived at the Olympic Games and Tony was there. So, Volshentsev for the Russians. The Russian system, David Volshentsev, he just won uh, three days ago a skiathlon in, uh, in Russia, way over in the middle of Russia. So he's been brought into this race. And if he's not fatigued after a 30 kilometer three days ago, then it'll be quite amazing. But he's got that opportunity at a World Cup. No uh, Velikshan in, involved in today's race, just to mention a lot of these men have uh, had to take time off to recover uh, the season has been pretty heavy Sochi has taken a lot out of them physically and here you can see Sveen coming up to 6,300 meters now plotting a knots of Germany the fastest man to this point ahead of Musgrave now Sveen was four seconds ahead of Musgrave and seven ahead of knots at five kilometers this is great absolutely great and that's seven seconds so he's increased his advantage as Rickardson starts David I'm surprised the Norwegians don't include Sveen more often remember Davos he came fifth in the 30 kilometer that was freestyle and uh, he's looking like uh, he's on rocket skis today as well well this will be interesting we've talked about how you recover of course Rickardson eighth in the 50 kilometer race just uh, last weekend and at one point at 38 kilometers he was in fifth place and he came home 24 seconds uh, behind of course the trio of Legkov and Vilajanin and Shenusov uh, to the delight of uh, President Putin because that gold medal of Legkov's was one of two that made sure that Russia finished at the top of the medal table in the Sochi Winter Olympic Games. The yellow and black of Jean-Marc Gaillard of France. Quality racer. And uh, Gaillard, who was sixth in the opening skiathlon in the Olympic Games for the French. Just having a look at the early splits now and Musgrave's opening 1300 meters in 315 still holding up there at that particular point He was three seconds quicker than Sveen, but Sveen pacing very well at the moment Hakala David uh, remember he made it through to the final yesterday in the sprint so four times around at maximum pace on a 1500 meter try just yesterday. He has to be a little tired And Simon Sveen, very much the pathfinder at the moment. Yet another Frenchman on this occasion, it's uh, Robin Duviar, wearing bib number 62 amongst the seeded men. And then in a minute's time, it'll be Paul Goldberg, the man who won the sprint here in the Lati Stadium. I have to say under bluer skies than we have this morning. Now here's uh, Emil Jonsson at 6,300 meters. He was uh, behind uh, Musgrave early on. And the seeds interspersed with some of the lower ranked uh, racers. No disrespect to them, but this is a practice which has meant to, it's enabled us to keep the racing a little bit more interesting and it's also given us the opportunity to see more of the seeded racers so here is uh, pal goldberg now he'll be full of confidence and zest because of his performances and again it's worth remembering with uh, goldberg that if you go right back to the beginning of the season uh, he was the winner of race number five and that was the Lillehammer 15 kilometer individual classic. This is freestyle, but that's 
two victories in the season so far, so his confidence is going to be good. And not bad. Yesterday, it has to play a part, though, David, uh, to do the to go through to the final, to take the final. Maximum effort four times over the 1,500 metres. It will be interesting to see if Paul Goldberg, I know he's raced fairly lightly over the last uh, few weeks, didn't, uh, wasn't included at the games. Letterman losing another odd second or so, up to 6,300 uh, metres. And Kali Halvarsson, well, I remember this man doing a fantastic job last year in the relay, the World Championship relay in Val de Fiemme, bringing them home to a great gold medal. Uh, my apologies to Goldberg, of course he was included. What I meant was he raced lightly at the Olympics, just the classic 15 kilometer, where he finished 18th. Well, uh, just to let you know that we'll be moving across to Eurosport International for the conclusion of this uh, race. And as you can see, we're still in the early stages in the seeded group, just about getting away. And Britain's Andrew Musgrave with a decent start, um, very much in the early mix of the competition. At 10 kilometers, uh, it's Florian Knotts, who's the man who's uh, leading as uh, we go back to the start for Shirota. Uh, not at the three-quarter, at the two-third stage of the race, I should say. Uh, two, 22 minutes 33. Razim of the Czech Republic, 20 seconds behind, and Musgrave, 20.5 seconds behind. At 10 kilometres, currently running third, ahead of the likes of Nusijainen of Finland, who's 30 seconds back. So uh, Florian Knotts of Germany, uh, a really good start for him in this race. And now, uh, waiting for Alex Harvey, who will wear bib number 70. And a very good morning to everybody on Eurosport International from Mike Dixon and myself, David Goldstrom, as we really come to the men who should be right to the fore in going for the major honours today and are also men vying for the Crystal Globe in the long distance races. And here's Alex Harvey, 112 points behind Jespersen of Norway, who leads the distance rankings ahead of Sunby, his Norwegian teammate, ahead of Legkoff, who is involved today, the Olympic 50 kilometer champion. He's in third place in the rankings and Harvey is fifth. So uh, really uh, interesting uh, race and we'll be uh, transferring to Eurosport International in about 30 seconds from now, perhaps a little bit less. So to enjoy the rest of this race, uh, please switch to Eurosport International in about 10 seconds from now. Well, Tony Livers of uh, Switzerland coming into second place. But the man in the clubhouse who leads at the moment is still the young German, Florian Knotts, ahead of Tony Livers. Still only one World Cup victory in his career. It was a joint victory in Davos, goodness knows how many years ago. I think it was over 50 kilometers as well. Uh, Razim is third, and Nusijainen in the clubhouse in fourth place. Andy Musgrave, who uh, finished uh, the winning time, or the leading time at the moment, 33 Point five eight, and add 43 seconds to that for uh, Andy's time. So about 34.40, can't quite do the maths that quickly, uh, but not a bad effort from him in a season that didn't quite uh, end at Sochi in the way that he'd hoped. Uh, lowly finish in the sprint, and at the end of it all, perhaps one or two lessons to be learnt from the preparation phase but nonetheless he's the best cross-country skier we've ever had as you see Sveen coming in here now this is another man to uh, keep uh, on the right side of now I just want to put this in context here uh, Sveen and Knotts Sveen at uh, the interval number 
4, which was 6.3 kilometres. Sveen was ahead of Knotts by some seven seconds. So it just shows you that Knotts has actually toughed it out and skied very well. I think uh, Knotts paced it so well. He, we saw him on the first five kilometres uh, within himself, then he picked the pace up and it seemed as if he was going his best for the final time around this five kilometre track. Now this is uh, Harvey coming up that first climb, coming out of the stadium for the second time and 14 seconds down there, Harvey, and just having a look at that, he was 14 seconds behind Sunby at 3.4 kilometres. Look, look at the attack there from Legkoff. Uh, it's as if it's a sprint. He's jumping up this hill in the deep snow, and it's just all about his incredible strength and, and his desire. The determination of this man is unmatchable. And there is a high relevance to this because uh, you might have thought that Legkoff, after his triumph, would, you know, take a rest, and who would blame him? Uh, but the reality is that World Cup is the day-to-day, -day, it's the business, it's the office, it's where they earn their wages, and Legkoff is in with a real shout of winning the Crystal Globe for the Distance World Cup. He started today only 36 points behind Chris Jesperson of Norway, who's absent. He finished 32nd in Sochi in the 50-kilometre race and uh, thus uh, doesn't have the energy to take on this. Sunbi is in here and he's just ahead of Legkov. And the difference between the two men in the endurance uh, Crystal Globe race is actually 23 points. Now, there's today's race and two more, so 300 points up for grabs. So, Legkov looking very much to try and win the distance Crystal Globe. It's advantage, in a sense, soon be to have that one-minute advantage that he started behind Legkov. And, uh, and looking very smooth, I've got to say, Sunbi. He's not panicking. There was almost uh, a frantic attacking from Legkov up on this section, but Sunbi is keeping it smooth and efficient, and it's only 2.2 2 now to the advantage. We saw it earlier at 4.6. Yeah, Sunbi uh, at uh, the third checkpoint, which was five kilometers, had uh, an advantage of almost six seconds over Legkov. Then it shrunk to uh, two seconds at 6.3 kilometers. And it means that Legkov is well aware of what Sunbi is doing behind, but he's got the harder job. And here, confirmation, 6,300 meters. So not yet at the half distance. And Daniel Rickardson there for Sweden and Matty Hekinen, the best for the host country. Just want to uh, once again uh, mention, which I'll do uh, in a moment, one particular fi finished performance. And that finished performance, uh, sadly, no uh, Sami Yoyovi with us today. Uh, he with Niva uh, Niskanen, the gold medalist at the Classic Sprint, and I think it's disappointing that he wasn't here to. Uh, get the applause from the Finnish crowd. Lettonen going into uh, fourth place and that pushes down uh, everybody a spot and Andrew Musgrave now 43 seconds behind Florian Knotts of Germany but still just in the top ten at the moment and there you saw the current leader. Here's the traditional run down that traditional right-hander that they uh, take coming into the stadium. But as they come down here, of course, Mike, this new introduction, which is that little rise. In, in other words, it makes you work harder. It does, and you need, we saw it yesterday in the sprint races, the athletes who attacked leading into the little bump, they, you of course, carry more energy over the top and get more energy into this section and again they've ri risen they raised up this section here which i think was a good addition to the sprint competition and of course coming into the end of the race here well Lars nelson for sweden had a particularly good race last uh, <laughs> and he's gone into seventh place which is the same place he finished on in the 15 kilometer in toblach uh, just before the olympic games and there is out there on the course and also back home an awful lot of Swedish talent.
and I think you're going to see a lot of it when we come to the Nordic Ski World Championships in Falun next season. But I've got to say that I'm really impressed with Florian Knotts because he is taking scalp after scalp here, the 21-year-old. And, you know, in terms of World Cup racing, he just doesn't have a record, but he will have today. Uh, all his work has been done at under-23 and junior level. So for a World Cup debut, this is quite some performance from Knotts. It, it's a wonderful performance. And Croker, we saw him come round that extremely tight right-hander. He carried great energy over the little bump. And, uh, well, maybe he'll dethrone Knotts. In fact, it's going to be very tight. I don't think he will. No, and he didn't have a performance in uh, Sochi. He can sprint as well as do the distance here, but... He is, is going he, to take it. Yeah, he is going to take it, but just narrowly. And a much more experienced racer, Krog, and pushes the German out of the big, warm, furry chair into second place. A 21-year-old, though, not it's great to see him there. And you know what? Maybe we'll see him there in the next couple of years, maybe next season, uh, leading the whole race, throughout the whole race. Legkov still attacking. Glorson, this is at 13.4 for Glorson. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Legkoff and Rickardson. They were virtually inseparable at 6.3 kilometers. At uh, 8.4 kilometers, they were virtually together as well within a second and 21 seconds ahead of uh, Shurota as well. So this is the state of play. There's some very good performances in here. The man in second place, Knotts. We've already praised him. Sveen from Norway, that's very respectable. Look at Yoshida there for Japan. And uh, Andy Musgrave now uh, slipping down the order as we expected. And just trying to check on him at Fif the moment. 15th position. 15th. Thank you, Mike. So that gives us uh, a little, that shows you there between Knotts and Krog. And you can see Krog, who leads at the moment, had an advantage of something like six seconds, came home three seconds ahead. So, you know, that was a, a turnaround of, uh, what, six to ten seconds. So a uh, good finish there by the Norwegian. And there you can see Andrew Musgrave in... 16th place at the moment now of course if he finishes in the top 30 mike he's going to get world cup points he will and of course uh, his best this season has been 17th position 16th at the moment i'm not sure he's going to better his uh, best world cup performance and 17th is great at, at this level and with the budget comparative budget that the british team don't have compared to every other team here yeah i'm not so much worried about that but uh, you know given that you know our, he didn't fulfill our expectations and he didn't fulfill his own expectations at Sochi. Having here in Lati disappointed himself yesterday because he didn't make the cut in the sprint, he didn't get into the top 30. If he could get even a couple of World Cup points here today, uh, I think that would give him a little confidence boost and that would be good. Very much and, and a great way to end uh, well, the final three weeks of World Cup racing. Of course, he will be racing further on into April and the Norwegian Championships uh, into April. Glerson, the man who leads. And of course, Glerson was the man who finished in the worst position of all, wasn't it? You know, fourth place in the Olympic sprint. And uh, remember that what an Olympic sprint that was with Ustagoff and Helner falling and uh, all the sort of chaos and Jonsson getting a lucky bronze and Pedersen the silver and Haderstad who fell yesterday, uh, an unforced error in the soft conditions. And here you can see Glerson coming in now to take the lead in this race by uh, 4.2 seconds. So Norway, Norway in the uh, top order. Well, Krog looks a, a disappointed athlete there, having to give up that nice warm seat, but it was only by four seconds. Rickardson, now this is uh, very relevant here because at the last interval we had them 8.4 kilometers, Sunbi leading Rickardson by 1.5 and Legkov 2.2. So the three 
leaders or the three men really contesting for the podium here are within a couple of seconds of each other at that was at 8.4 kilometers and Rickardson is the man who wearing bib 58 of course is the early starter so he's there to be shot at but at the moment he's maintaining his form very well 30 seconds, 30.5. He seems to have uh, picked up his pace, and Rickardson so, so efficient on his skis. Big, tall figure, and uh, pressing deeply into the soft snow. And he was another man who had a major chance in the 50. If you remember, Mikey was uh, in fifth place with 12 kilometers to go, and held it together reasonably well, but actually came home 24 seconds behind Legloff, Legkoff, Vilekjanin and Shanusov. Well, the final break from those three was uh, an incredible, terrible blast, and it did uh, destroy the rest of the pack that were with them. There were some 15, 20 athletes with them, with just 900 meters to go. This is the only easy part of the track, David, uh, and the athletes are taking it carefully. You can recover on this section, but this extremely tight right hand, or the tightest uh, in any World Cup track at pace, and you can see the snow is pushing away as the snow plow into it. Some stones on the inside as well. Just after half distance, Glerson and Hagen, and there wasn't too much to uh, choose between the two of them. Just about a, a second, really. And uh, just looking at it at the uh, last check that we got before they came in at 11,300 metres, actually Glerson with about a four-second advantage over Hagen. And... You can see that the Finn, who had the possibility of uh, closing the gap on Glerson, now outside and outside uh, also knots. And fourth place into the Finnish order there. This really is a Rickardson uh, for a podium, in my opinion, even though he's a very early starter of 58. Uh, this is really competitive with the big names of Sunbi and Legkov behind him. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. I think he could stay there. I think it's uh, Legkov and, as you said, Sunbi are the two men who are going to really fight this out. Now, this is going to be uh, pretty important in terms of that endurance uh, title because with only, uh, what, 23 points separating them in the distance rankings of the World Cup season. This is Legkov and Sunbi I'm referring to. Remember, whoever wins the race will get 100 points. Whoever comes second will get 20 points. So for Legkov, he's really going to want to close that gap down. Sunbi, uh, he's going to get big points here, which is going to enhance his situation in the overall World Cup because Jesperson, who's in second place, isn't here. Legkov is ooh, 400 points behind in the overall chase. That was a... I thought it was a, a, a slowish finish down at the extreme right-hander, but he has extended his advantage on the next athlete by another four seconds, who's now going to leave the hot seat. That was great performance from Rickardson. And his early pacing, David, he really took it within himself for the first 7.5 kilometers and then really opened up into his full pace, full technique. Yeah, in his early 30s, uh, Danny Rickardson from Östersund, and a man who's had one World Cup success, 15 kilometers in classic style back in Drammen in 2011. Drammen, where we go to Wednesday next week for the famous classic sprint. But Rickardson, that's a, a really good performance by him. And if I'm not wrong, and I don't think I am, that will be his first podium of the season if he uh, hangs on to it. Now, you can see Gaia gingerly <laughs> snowplow, just a, to make sure there's no mistake. There's a couple of variants taking that corner. They're all snowplowing to kill their speed off. Some are taking it, nipping it really tight on the inside. Most are taking it slightly wider. But this is interesting. You get the glide, but then you've got to push over there to get the Swedish. I think it's an interesting introduction into the final stadium chase. I think it was needed. The, the, the flat section uh, previously on that sprint course, it was uh, just a long glide into the stadium and then another step up around this final bend. It certainly made it more interesting. 
So uh, chasing hard, John Mark Guy, he's a great servant to the French team, isn't he? And so always gives his best, gives everything as most of these athletes do. 45 behind it, still great racing. Mike Rickardson in his 30s, but still probably got uh, a good few seasons to offer. Went to Sochi, 35th place last weekend in the 50 kilometer race, 21st in the 15 classic, 6 in the ski athlon. So, unfortunately, uh, race by race at Sochi, his form or his finished positions deteriorated as the efforts took their toll. But the sixth place in the Skiathlon behind uh, Dario Colonia. Just to reiterate, no Dario here. The double Olympic gold medalist from Sochi resting, and who would blame him? Shurota, who's never really been involved here in the chase for home. Well, last time it's got to be a great feeling. This is the high point of the course, David. Uh, slightly easier section after this uh, for Skor Rota to get his recovery back. And for those of you up in the Huntley Ski Club, uh, well, just to keep you in touch with Andrew Musgrave, he's in 20th place at the moment. And I can tell you, he's taken the scalps of some interesting races today. Tim Schanke of Germany, Babakov of Canada, uh, Jonsson of Sweden. And I can tell you, there's a few more that he's uh, grabbed as well. Um, Ustagoff is uh, behind him. And also Devon Kershaw. So he's taken a few useful scalps today. And... There's every chance, Mike, I think, that he could stay in the top 30 and get some World Cup points now, which would be very good. I th yeah, I think, I hope he will. Of course, Legkov's going to push him down. Sundby's going to push him down. Well, this is the interesting part, isn't it, now, as to uh, Sundby and Legkov. Legkov with the disadvantage. There he is ahead of uh, Rickardson. And that's really interesting because... If you uh, look at the positions at 7.3 kilometers, uh, you've got a situation where Legkoff and Rickardson, uh, just looking at 13.4 kilometers, I should say, Legkoff was actually five seconds ahead of Rickardson, and Sunby was six seconds ahead of. Richardson. Well, I must say, Sunbi is, is looking, now he really has opened up into his full pace. Look at that attack. And they, uh, surprisingly, at the Olympics, the person who was giving him a hard time for, uh, well, his 13th place in the 15 kilometer classic was his mum. She said he needs to pick his game up. And also in the relay, of course, where they finished, what, fourth or fifth? Well, I think the worst thing for Sunbi was actually finishing fourth place in the 50 kilometer race. I mean, that was really the hardest thing to you know to take but it, it's looking better and better and he knows it he's got 10 seconds now on uh, leg off and that's decisive yeah but i tell you what <laughs> he'd swap wherever he finishes today uh with you know winning the race in uh, sochi when you consider it uh, leg off uh, seven hundredths ahead of Vilajanin and one hundredth uh, behind was Chenusov and then just a second behind was Sunbi. You know, what a great finale to the campaign. And there you can see Rickardson waiting for what he believes to be will, will be the inevitable. And... So look at Florian Knotts there, even demoted down a fifth. That is a fantastic performance for the German. 21 years of age, World Cup debut in fifth place. This is the day, David, he will remember for the rest of his life. This is the day he has landed, really, in, in cross-country skiing. Of course, he's been a big name as a junior and a youth, and uh, but now in the big field, he really has landed. Now, Legkov, there you can see the advantage that he's got in terms of the clock at the moment, or what he's got left, I should say. Oh, he's gone for the wide option. He'd hit the little gravel patch that seems to be appearing there. Now, at the last checkpoint, he only had a couple of seconds advantage over Rickardson. And Legkoff and Rickardson were, in turn, 10 seconds down on Sunby. Oh, and that wasn't clever either. 
and you can just tell here that the petrol is running out. Uh, this is his mind is, that's really driving him here. The legs are like jelly, the lactate's built up, and this uh, really hurts. It's mind over matter. Rickerson looking here. Ten, nine, eight. You know what's going to happen here, don't you? Five, four. He's not going to do it, and Rickardson is going to get the higher placing, and this is costly. Oh! by half a second and uh, Rickardson maintains his advantage and those two little errors in the stadium cost him the lead. And I would say it was the energy that Lakoff did not carry from this uh, just behind what uh, Sunbi's gone round now. He didn't carry as much pace out of that bend. Sunbi on the far side there coming round to pick up another 100 World Cup points but you've got to keep working here and uh, Sunby, time evaporating, Rickardson sitting in the chair, looking on, because remember there was 10 seconds uh, in Sunby's favour, that was at 13,400 metres, and you can see that Sunby's going to do it, and he's going to come home, he won't have gained much, he won't have lost much, but he's won the race, and he's won the race decisively there, he takes the 100 World Cup points, and Martin Jönsrud Sunby, enhances his position at the top of the Wiesman World Cup rankings, goes to 1,127 points, and he gains six, he gains 40 points on Legkoff in the overall, and, of course, he gains 40 points on him in the chase for the Crystal Globe. And look how much this means to him, David. It didn't go all his way at all at the Olympic Games, but from the very first time out in the World Cup in Kusamo, where he won that little uh, three-day stage event, and now back to his winning ways, but sadly that blip at the Olympic Games. Well, it's so hard, but he now leads the distance rankings as well as the overall World Cup. And, well, he's, he's set himself a really hard task this season with the amount of racing that he's undertaken. But at 29 years of age, uh, confirming that it's going to take... Uh, a monumental effort from anybody else to take the Crystal Globe for the endurance racing away from him. But I think we can happily, well, happily say for him and his fans, I think this victory seals the World Cup because there's only Oslo, the 50 kilometer there, and Falun, that's 200 points. And when you look at the overall World Cup standings, he was some 300 points almost ahead of Chris Jespersen who didn't race today. He was 400 against uh, 400 ahead of Legkoff and Legkoff has got less points today. Nortug didn't race and I think Martin Jonsrud Sunsby with this victory has won the overall World Cup for the season. Ah, what a day, and that's why he was making so much uh, of a noise of it. And, and we just saw there in the caption that they, they, the three at the top, Sunsby, Rickardson, Legkoff, they're ahead of Glurson by 45 seconds, or soon be it. It's a huge gap back to fourth place. Well, there in 27th place, you can see Andrew Musgrave of Great Britain. Well done, Andrew, to finish in the top 30. That's four World Cup points you've collected today and I think a little confidence boost. Yesterday was not nice, not qualifying for the sprint, but you've made up for it today by getting some World Cup points. Uh, a strong and positive start, uh, but at the end of the day, you're in the top 30, but you have to say that the man of the moment is uh, this man, the winner, I believe, unofficially, of course, Mike, but the winner of the Wiesman World Cup overall crystal globe for 2014 he hasn't won the endurance globe but the overall title i don't think he can be caught with just two races to go well he can't be mathematically no he can't and leg off i think that was an outstanding performance the week that he's been through the success the press uh, interest that he's had i think he's uh, done fantastic here to uh, place himself in third and just losing it at the end there for a second please yeah, so uh, just to reiterate the performances, there's still plenty out on the track here. Sunby, the winner and the World Cup champion for the season. Rickardson, fantastic race from him. 
and he finishes second, the best for Sweden, Legkov the best for Russia, then uh, Glersen and Krog for Norway, so three Norwegians in the top five, and Shirota making it uh, four in the top ten. The uh, rookie, Florian Knotts, seventh place on his World Cup debut, fantastic. Alex Harvey, the best for Canada in eighth place, and then... Uh, after Alex, uh, the best Frenchman, Jean-Marc Gaillard, Matti Heikkinen, the best for the host country, Finland. And then the man who won the sprint yesterday, Paul Goldberg, in 11th place. A notable performance in 12th place from Simon Andreas Sveen for Norway. That's a very good performance given his limited experience. Switzerland, uh, no Dario Colonia today, but Tony Livers, the best for his country. The best for Japan, Keishin Yoshida in 16th place. And the best Italian, Roman Clara in uh, 19th. And the Czech, Alice Razim, completing the top 20. 1 minute 23.2 off the uh, pace of the leader. And Andy Musgrave in 27th place, 136.6 behind Sunday. It's good, it's very good. We must mention Andrew Young as well. He's still out there. In fact, should be coming through soon to this point. But uh, at the last checkpoint, 11.3, 78th position and 208 behind at that point. He'll lose a little bit more in times of the time behind the Sunbi's lead time. And of course, a little later today comes the women's 10 kilometers. So two rotations, the temperature getting warmer all the time. And that's going to be Harder, but there's uh, everybody wants Legkov's uh, signature, <laughs> don't they? And there, uh, well, I'm sure. I wonder if he drove here in his Mercedes, which he was given from, uh, well, from the Russian Olympic Committee, as all were, as all the medal winners at the Winter Olympics. Well, Legkov, of course, now forever and a day a legend in Russia to win the 50-kilometer Olympic final. You know there. You go through the record book and uh, it's just amazing the names that you see there. And he's now right there alongside. And I have to say, Mike, you know, uh, it's been a while in coming. But, you know, when you look at Legkov's uh, performances, uh, you know, thoroughly, utterly deserved to uh, get that uh, gold medal. And, you know, he's, what, 30 years of age, comes from Khanti Mansis, which you know well from the world of biathlon. And when you look at his Olympic record, you know, he was fourth in Whistler in the 30 kilometer pursuit. That was unlucky. You remember the World Championships last year, Val de Fiemme, he was fourth there in the 50 kilometer classic race. And he was fourth in Liberets in the 30 kilometer pursuit. He'd had a whole series of near misses. So it was not before time. It, and, right, and I think he's been given a lot of freedom. He has been the last few years within the team structure. He goes down to New Zealand and Australia every summer for the last uh, three seasons. And I think that's a large part to his more recent success. He's getting more skiing in in the summer months. He's doing a, giving a lot of variety. And uh, at 30 year old, it's, it's, it has lifted him. It's given him a change of scenery. And you can become stale with normal routine. And he broke away from that. Yes, and I think it'll be interesting to see how he prepares for next season for the Nordic Ski World Championships in Falun. And, you know, at 30, no reason why we can't see him in Pyeongchang and uh, the Winter Olympic Games of 2018. Uh, but I think, you know, what he's going to do over the next couple of years is perhaps enhance his reputation. Now, I don't mean to take anything away from Sunbi today, because Sunbi, the winner of the race and the winner of the World Cup as a result of his achievement today, but Legkov uh, is very special, because it, remember how in the, what, the 90s, Mike, the Russian men's team were just in the doldrums. They were, they went through a bad patch, of course, early 80s, they were the, the, one of the strongest nations throughout the 70s, they were dominant as well. But then I think a little, uh, the, the money spent on ski-based technology, that's the preparation of the ski base, and the waxes, all left the Russian team behind for a while. They're now buying into that knowledge base and testing a lot more and bringing in foreign experts, and that has lifted the team as well in recent times. Yes, and I don't think... Uh uh, you, uh, it did them any good in the 90s. They had a rather scattered approach with people all over the country. And uh, now they have a system 
and that system is serving them really, really well when you look at the number of competitive Russians. Yeah, well, look at, and looking at, I think waxing is a huge issue as well. The Norwegian budget for the waxes and the technicians is over three million pounds, so nearly four million euros, and uh, it's the largest uh, spread of wealth in terms of getting the base of your skis just correct. Didn't work out for them at the Olympics, though, but uh, generally in all the World Cups, they do not have bad days the Norwegian team whereas the Russians we've seen that in the past with Lekov and the Tour de Ski he lost it because he had such poor wax uh, on the base of his skis in uh, Val de Fiem a couple of years ago yeah I think it's just I mean we, we've uh, praised Lekov and rightly so but worth mentioning of course Sunby in the opening race of course he had better fortune because he was the bronze medalist behind Marcus Hellner and indeed Dario Colonia who won that race and he only missed out there by 1.4 seconds so when you when you look at it he's missed two gold medals by 2.4 seconds at the olympic games and you know sunby you know who's been putting in a full day's work right the way through the world cup season and then to go to sochi you know and get a bronze and almost get another medal in the 50 kilometers that's a that's a heck of an achievement so a bronze and the world cup title for him uh, nothing to be sniffed about and Daniel Rickardson of course again a bronze medalist from the Sochi Olympic Games behind Dario Colonia and Johan Olsen his Swedish teammate there that that you know today to be in second place uh, that is a terrific finish from him and it just shows that he is actually strengthening now and and I think that his success with the eighth as well in the 50 kilometer last week Rickardson uh, he really has planned his season well, Rickardson, racing more lightly in terms of uh, all the World Cups. He's rested out and prepared himself specifically for the Olympic Games, and Rickardson still carrying that form now. Okay, Martin, John Drude Sundby of uh, Norway. Uh, he is the man. conditions out there today, but it uh, didn't seem to bother you too much. Yeah, for sure. It's difficult here. It's, it's, not, it's not, uh, not any natural snow, so everything is artificial, but uh, I, I thought uh, they did a kind of good job here. Uh, with the conditions they have and uh, yeah I'm satisfied uh, uh, it was a real competition the conditions was a bit difficult but I think the, it was quite fair from uh, the first starters to the last so it was good and uh, you come in here today wearing the yellow bib uh, and with the win you uh, increase your lead in the overall uh, definitely must be a goal to try and keep it all the way to Fallon yeah for sure the Olympics was quite kind of uh, yeah we didn't have the best luck in the Olympics, so we had a few not so good competitions. So I'm highly motivated now for uh, the job towards uh, keeping this uh, this yellow jersey. Congratulations on the victory today. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, by my reckoning, uh, uh, I think he should have been congratulating him for winning the overall World Cup for the season. Just to reiterate for everybody else, the day started with Sunbi 120, 1,027 points. He's now got 1,127. And uh, Jesperson on 739, so he can't catch him. And Legkov got uh, uh, 60 points. He's on 686. He can't catch him. Peter Nortog didn't get any points. He can't catch him. There's only two races to go. He's the champ. That was by my reckoning, but uh, and Sumbi was playing it careful as well. He doesn't want to count all his chickens yet, but he, as he stated, he's highly motivated, and he showed every bit of that desire in this race. Mike, he can choose not to start. He could fall over. <laughs> he still won the thing. He has. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he'll want to keep uh, his own determination and focus as sharp as possible for more titles, more victories. And he's a really nice guy, just a modest guy. As he said, a little bit unlucky at the Olympics. And maybe it absolutely well, it was the case. They did have some problems uh, with their skis. And uh, this shows uh, a little bit of the modesty of the man. You know, the race is still going on and he could easily uh, pop out of the chair, but he hasn't. He's respecting all the other racers <laughs> until the last man crosses the line. He stays in the chair. Yeah, I, and uh, yeah, he really, he really is uh, a likable character. And, uh, and, and as you say, modesty is, is his game as well. And he must have been so disappointed at the Olympics. Uh, wearing that yellow bib in is, is often bad luck. Uh, oh, not bad luck, but more pressure on the athlete who wears that yellow bib going into the Olympics. It's almost a curse. And I just want to uh, check that nothing untoward has happened to Andrew Musgrave's position. He is still 27th. He is still 136.6 off 
the winning time today. So decent performance from him. And of course, midweek, the uh, racing goes to uh, Drummond. And just to uh, reiterate, uh, there's the classic sprint in Drammen, the 50 kilometers in uh, Oslo, then you've got another sprint uh, in Falun, and then the skiathlon uh, to round it all off. And okay, you're not going to see Sunbi uh, too bothered about the sprints, but essentially it's the Oslo 50 and the Falun skiathlon in terms of the endurance racing, and nobody is going to take the World Cup from Sunbi. And uh, very shortly, uh, it'll be time for us to take our leave. We're going to Kvitiel. John Clark will be your host there for the men's uh, super giant slalom on the Olympic track of, uh, what, 1994. So uh, do stay and enjoy that. We'll be back a, a little later with the women's 10 kilometers. That uh, should be on Eurosport 2. And of course, there's still ski jumping to come here on Eurosport International to round off the Lati Festival. From Mike Dixon and myself, David Goldstrom, thank you for uh, spending an early morning with us. Bye-bye from Lati.